purpose. And for keep you waiting and have one nice thing. Have you here after the spring for you? So uh, I'll be very quick. So today we're very pleased to have Dr. Laura Kim join us. Uh, Dr. Kim is a physician, um, policy researcher, educator, and uh, author. In 2006, she published the uh, Confronting Zoonosis, Linking Human and Veterinary Medicine in the CDC Journal, and helped launch the One Health Initiative. So she is a co-founder of the One Health Initiative and the lecturer at the Princeton University. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Ken. Well, thank you so much, Kai. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with all of you. And uh, let me share my screen now. Uh, and um, I have to apologize. I can try and go into presentation mode, but oftentimes it freezes, but let me, let me give it a shot and see if it, see if it works. Um, so I'm gonna uh, talk with you, a One Health analysis of food safety and security, antimicrobial resistance and climate change in the 21st century. century. And yes, they are all connected. Um, it's important for us to recognize that agriculture is the foundation of civilization. Climate change threatens agriculture and food security. Antimicrobials are the foundation of modern medicine and antimicrobial resistance threatens antimicrobial use and food safety. And we need both if we want a modern advanced society. Just a few definitions. When I say food security, I mean no hunger and food safety means no foodborne illness. When I talk about antimicrobial resistance in this talk, I'm gonna focus on bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. Now the One Health concept is very simply that human, animal, plant, environmental, and ecosystem health are linked. And this concept provides a very useful framework for examining these complex issues, such as those that I'm talking about today. And if we wanna develop effective policies to address these health threats, we must examine the root causes, and people interact with their environment every day by inhaling air, drinking water and other fluids, and eating the plants and animals that we call food. And I just wanna point out the One Health Initiative website that my colleagues and I run. Now, many people have uh, tried to visualize the One Health concept, and some use intersecting circles, uh, with uh, increasing coordination, communication, collaboration. Others have humans, animals, environments intersecting with One Health in the middle. The uh, wildlife folks like to highlight wildlife health separate from domesticated animal health and human health. And my colleagues in Sweden use an umbrella graphic that includes a lot of things, but most importantly, zoonotic infections in one intersecting circle and comparative medicine and chronic diseases, translational medicine in the other. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the zoonotic issues. Now I visualize One Health as a multi-dimensional cube, a matrix, interdimensional matrix, if you will, in one dimension are the One Health factors, humans, animals, plants, environments, and ecosystems. On another dimension, the complexity factors, looking at providing scale, microbial or cellular, individual and population levels. And then you can have the political, social, and economic factors along another dimension. And that can be represented by political borders such as local, regional, national, or international and global. And there can be a fourth dimension, which I'm not representing or trying to represent, and that's the dimension of time, which can be in days, months, years, decades, or eras. Now you can squash the cube into a two-dimensional framework, and then you can see the intersections between these different dimensions. And in this talk, I'm going to define environments as the abiotic or the soil, water, air aspects of defined geographic areas and ecosystems, the biotic interactions, the microbial flora and fauna uh, within defined geographic areas. 
So in this talk, then we're going to do a One Health analysis looking at different factors, One Health factors, complexity factors, and following it up with the political, social, and economic factors, just a brief uh, touching on that. So in other words, let's do a One Health satellite perspective on these issues. Our first analysis, we have almost 8 billion humans on the planet. And according to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, we have around 30 billion terrestrial food animals. And as the famous children's book author, Taro Gomi writes, all animals eat, so everyone poops. And indeed, according to this paper published by David Berendis in Nature Sustainability, published in 2018, they estimate that humans and their domesticated food animals produce around 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter each year. And that is increasing. And to just put it into perspective on how much that is, 4 trillion kilograms would fill over 1.6 million Olympic sized swimming pools, or to put it another way to bury the entire surface areas of Los Angeles and New York in six feet of feces, uh, which is a lot of fecal matter. Uh, if you look at just human fecal matter, um, a lot of people are still defecating outdoors called open defecation around uh, 673 million according to Statistica, oops. Um, a lot of these people are in uh, developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and South America. Uh, a lot of people don't have access to basic sanitation and so they, uh, they use open fields um, which has uh, health and environmental and human health uh, consequences. Uh, animals uh, use open defecation all the time. I mean, there's sanitation systems are designed to process human fecal matter. They do not des uh, are des they are not designed to uh, process animal fecal matter. Uh, and there's very little research actually done on all the animal fecal matter. Now, it's important to point out that 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter that we produce, 80% of it comes from animals. Uh, very little study. This one study done in 2014 in the Netherlands um, looked at 34 countries to see uh, if they had policies related to manure management. Uh, 30 of them did, but uh, having legislation on what to do with all this fecal matter is one thing, but actually enforcing it is another. And most of these countries uh, have weak enforcement on uh, manure management. Now, this is an issue that is not solely an, uh, a problem for uh, poor or developing countries. Wealthy countries, uh, such as the United States, have large concentrated animal feeding operations that have uh, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of animals being raised in enclosed concentrated areas, and they're producing a lot of fecal matter. And indeed, this one study, the latest one, 2008, the US Government Accountability Office, found that there's no federal agency that consistently collects reliable data on these CAFOs, but they did find that some large operations can produce uh, more than 1.6 million tons of uh, manure a year, um, some that can generate more raw waste than some U.S. cities produce annually. So this is a major issue that's just not being discussed. There's a lot of pathogens in human fecal matter. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of all of these pathogens, but just as there's lots of pathogens in human feces, there's lots of pathogens in animal feces, but again, very few studies examining these pathogens in animal feces and few studies looking at uh, their health implications uh, on uh, foodborne pathogens, waterborne pathogens, or uh, just a direct contamination of people. 
Uh, nevertheless, in 2015, the World Health Organization released a report estimating the global burden of foodborne illness. They estimate that around 600 million people get six, around 420,000 die. Children under the age of five make up 40% of the cases. But most importantly, most of, the, uh, most of these illnesses are due to diarrheal disease agents. Uh, and most of these diarrheal disease agents are in fecal matter, many of them in um, human, uh, animal fecal matter. Sorry, it's uh, problematic. Um, again, we focus primarily on human fecal matter and the sanitation systems that either do or don't exist, but nobody's talking about all of this animal fecal matter in the environment that's contaminating our food, our water, uh, and, uh, and, and the people living in those environments, uh, making the people sick. So that now brings me to this second one, health analysis looking at plants. So the world has over 50,000 edible plants, but just three of them, rice, maize, and wheat, provide 60% of the world's food energy intake. Uh, and these plants have health needs. Um, What's relevant in our discussion today are the uh, macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now in 1944, Norman Bar Borlaug, pictured here, who was a plant pathologist, worked for the Rockefeller Foundation to try to improve wheat harvest because a, a lot of the uh, wheat crops were, uh, were dying from disease and uh, there were, uh, problematic growing conditions. So he developed some new wheat varieties and new crop management practices, which spread from Mexico to Asia and South America. And this was known as the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution was tremendous in uh, staving off famine for much of the world. And you can see in these graphs that for the same amount of land uh, that was being used to uh, grow the crops, the yields just took off uh, and it was just uh, amazing. Um, and you can see here the cereal yield in some countries are very high. However, there were problems with the Green Revolution. Um, intensive farming practices that were needed for this intensive yield from the land led to soil erosion, water shortages, um, micronutrient deficiencies in the soil, a dependency on high nitrogen synthetic fertilizers, which we'll get to more in a minute, vulnerability to pests and a high need for uh, pesticides. Uh, and because these crops were genetically engineered, um, they were uh, labeled genetically modified organisms, which could lead to political opposition. Now in 1961, 1.5 times more animal manure uh, was used uh, as fertilizer than synthetic fertilizer, but because of the Green Revolution, uh, now in, 20, uh, in, the, the late, uh, in 2019 and onwards, uh, four times more synthetic fertilizer now is being used than manure. Uh, and if manure is not being used as fertilizer, then we have to ask, well, what's being done with it? Because again, uh, we're producing 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter, 80% of which is from animals. And if it's not being used as fertilizer, then what's being done with it? Uh, now, there are some advantages to using manure as fertilizer because it does help uh, to nourish the soil. Um, that you don't necessarily get with the high nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, and that brings me now to my third one health analysis, looking at environments and ecosystems. And you'll see where I'm coming. Uh, it will kind of all tie together with, uh, with this uh, section. Now, climate change threatens agriculture and agriculture worsens climate change. And in order to truly understand climate change, we need to think like geologists. And we need to look at the geologic timeline of the temperature of the planet. If we look at the Paleozoic era, uh, yes, the planet was very hot. 
but it's important to point out that the land was barren because the, it was hot uh, and there was thriving life in the seas. We definitely do not want to get back to this level of heat uh, on our planet. Uh, with time, the planet began to cool. You get to the Pliocene era and then the Pleistocene era, which was the Ice Age. Now, the uh, planet, much of the planet was covered in thick layers of ice. Humans did exist. Their, um, their survival was tenuous. Uh, and then inexplicably, around 10,000 years ago, the, the uh, planet began to warm. The Ice Age ended. Uh, and you get to the beginning of the Holocene. Now, so for the past 10,000 years, and this, oops, and this is, sorry, this is when agriculture was developed about 10,000 years ago. And the reason why it could develop was because the plant was warm enough to allow it. So when we talk about climate change, it means change from this Holocene baseline that has allowed agriculture and civilization to exist. Now, there was a little deviation below the Holocene baseline and that was the little ice age. We have now gone up about one degree above this Holocene baseline and we're starting to see the effects of climate change. Now, the artists from during the little ice age documented for us what it looked like. You had a lot of, uh, frozen, the Thames froze over in Britain and they had frost bears. They had frozen wasteland and Flanders ice skating on the main canal in Rotterdam. But most importantly, the Little Ice Age was noted for crop failures, bread riots, famine and wars. So when, uh, when uh, food security breaks down, so does civil society and you wind up uh, with, uh, with wars. And it's a very ugly, uh, ugly situation indeed, one that we want to avoid at all costs. Now in 2010, the World Bank did some climate modeling, estimating agricultural yields in 2050 due to climate change effects, assuming current agricultural practices and crop varieties, and they determined that much of the planet is going to become too hot and too dry to grow food. And as again, as we said, uh, we're already starting to see the impact of this. But even with, even with that situation, uh, even today though, we still have a lot of food insecurity, a lot of hunger, particularly in uh, poor developing countries like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, South America, but even in the United States where the color is a uh, monolithic blue, we have a lot of food insecurity here as well. So um, this is a major issue that uh, one that uh, really needs to get uh, much more attention than, uh, than it's getting. Now that brings me to um, greenhouse gases because manure and synthetic fertilizer emit greenhouse gases. In fact, they're major emitters of methane and nitrous oxide. Now, if we look, if we use carbon dioxide as the baseline, methane is about 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide at trapping heat. And nitrous oxide is about 265 times more potent at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. So these are greenhouse gases that are extremely potent and should be of major concern. Um, it's just, uh, I just want to point out that Basically, these greenhouse gases that we're burning are decomposed plants and animals. Pressure, heat, and time produce cold petroleum gas. So we're just burning old, dead animals and plants up into the atmosphere. And that's what, that's what the fossil fuels basically are made from. Um, in terms of uh, what we in the United States emit, according to the US Environmental Protection Agency, we emit about 17% of our greenhouse gases are methane and nitrous oxide. Ag of the different uh, economic sectors, agriculture produces about 10% of the greenhouse gases. But most importantly, 
If you look at the sources of methane and nitrous oxide, manure management produces 9% of methane, enteric fermentation a whopping 27%, nitrous oxide manure management 4%, and a whopping 78% of agricultural soil management produces nitrous oxides. So in other words, enteric fermentation, manure, and the uh, use of high nitrogen fertilizer, agricultural soil management, major emitters of the most potent greenhouse gases that are trapping heat. Now you might ask, well, what is enteric fermentation? Well, uh, cattle have four chambered stomachs, one of which is called the rumen, and it acts as a fermenter uh, of the feeds, uh, and that produces methane. And uh, when this methane builds up, the cow burps and releases it. And if you've got a lot of uh, ruminants, uh, you've got a lot of methane. Different animals produce different uh, levels of methane. Uh, the beef, the ruminants, beef, dairy, and buffalo produce a lot of enteric methane. Uh, chickens, not so much. Goats are ruminants. They also produce methane as do sheep, but not pigs. So chickens are probably uh, more um, environmentally friendly than your average ruminant. Let's now shift gears and move from environments to ecosystems and talk a bit about antimicrobial resistance. Um, remember, uh, it threatens the practice of modern medicine. Oops. Um, and it turns out that antimicrobial resistance is ancient and everywhere. Um, for a long time, people thought that, or scientists thought that uh, microbes used antibiotics as a form of chemical warfare against each other, but it turns out it appears that they use minute amounts as a form of communication with each other, which is a very different thing. And uh, using metagenomics, uh, where you extract DNA or genetic material directly from the soil, they have found resistance genes everywhere in the Arctic and the Antarctic and places that have never seen anthropogenic exposure. Uh, and so we're dealing with a, with a much bigger issue than, uh, than we uh, originally believed. This isn't something that is just due to our practice. This is pre-existing and our massive use of antibiotics in humans, in animals, on crops, is increasing the expression of these resistance genes and the bacteria are sharing them with each other much faster than we can develop new antimicrobials. So we are working against nature and we're going to lose. So how are we adversely impacting the global resistome? Again, poor sanitation leading to foodborne, waterborne illnesses from all the manure in our environment indiscriminate antibiotic use, untreated human and animal waste, land and water contamination, and then the wildlife spread these resistance genes as well. All of them together conspire to uh, worsen antimicrobial resistance. Uh, manure, uh, particularly animal manure, also can serve as a potential hotspot for microbes to share uh, uh, resistance genes with each other. So again, the manure con connection. So let's now quickly go to the fourth analysis, looking at the political, social, and economic factors. Uh, food security is the foundation of civiliz civilization. It means no hungry people, and it's built on three pillars, food availability, food access, or affordability, and food use. Food security is so important that the UN uh, listed it as number two of its sustainable development goals in terms of zero hunger. There are, there are political implications of food insecurity. If food becomes unavailable or too expensive, civil society breaks down and people riot. So it's in uh, government's interest to make, to make sure that their people have enough food to eat. 
Now, there are countries that eat a lot more meat than other countries, particularly the United States. We, we are one of the highest consumers in the world, so we are in no moral position to tell uh, anybody else what they can or cannot eat. But eating meat is the norm in most countries, with one exception, India, where they have the largest fraction of vegetarians in the world. But even in India, uh, demand for animal proteins such as buffalo milk is increasing. It is possible to change national dietary preferences, but it's not easy and it requires cultural and societal change. Uh, in the US, more Americans are cutting back on meat. Some of the reasons are concerns about their health or the environment. Uh, but again, this is a, not an easy thing to do, and you can't force people to demand that they all become vegetarian uh, because it's, uh, you know, eating meat is ingrained in many of our uh, societal functions and religions. Um, it's not, it's uh, not, again, not an easy thing to change. So now a, a recap on our findings. Uh, humans and domesticated animal populations are growing and producing increasing amounts of fecal matter each year. Animals produce 80% of it, but it's generally ignored. Um, human and animal fecal matter contain many pathogens, but sanitation systems are designed to process human fecal matter, not animal fecal matter. So the question is what's being done with all of this animal fecal matter produced in CAFOs? Uh, and in countries around the world, there's little oversight of it. Now plants need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to grow, which is contained in manure, uh, but synthetic fertilizer uses predominance, predominates, uh, and of course, all of this manure and this high nitrogen fertilizer is emitting methane and nitrous oxide, which are potent greenhouse gases uh, worsening climate change. Manure is also contaminating the global resistome, which worsens antimicrobial resistance. And all of these together, uh, these findings impact food safety and the practice of medicine and food security and the continuation of agriculture and civilization. So you might be asking, well, what can be done? Well, in 2016, uh, the UN General Assembly met to deliberate on antimicrobial resistance. Um, they agreed that this is a, a crisis and requires political solutions uh, and tasked the uh, World Health Assembly and the World Health Organization to develop global action plan. Um, the global action plan that they developed to serve as a model for all nations to use, uh, one of which had objective three to reduce the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention measures. But nowhere in the action plan is the issue of animal manure management and its ecosystem impact. And that is a major oversight and we won't make any headway until that is addressed. Now there are strategies to reduce methane and nitrous oxide in terms of manure management. You can change the way manure is stored. You can have methane digesters capturing it, uh, converting it into renewable energy. For agricultural soil management, there are strategies to use low nitrogen fertilizer. You can have drip irrigation, no-till farming where you're tilling. When you till, you release methane, uh, nitrous oxide, the use of cover crops. So there are strategies in agriculture where you can reduce the uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Unfortunately, uh, there's been no mention of agriculture's uh, contributions to greenhouse gas emissions. There was no mention of it in the Paris Climate Agreement. There was no mention of it in COP26 in Glasgow. There was some mention of it. There's a uh, recognition of it in COP23 in Fiji in 2017. But most of the, um, and they weren't really able to get very far 
but most of the um, discussion was on climate change's impact or threat to agriculture, not so much on agriculture's contributions to climate change. So both of them need to be discussed. In California, uh, there was a bill that was passed in 2014 uh, to reduce uh, methane. Uh, they, bet they allocated 12 million to support dairy methane reduction projects using dairy digesters. New York State recently passed uh, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act into law in 2019. And there is a brief little mention of um, management practices and land use in agriculture and forestry uh, for long-term carbon sequestration, but not so much focusing on um, methane and nitrous oxide emissions from agriculture. The US Congress, there was the Agriculture Resilience Act of 2021 that was introduced with a goal to re, uh, for a 50% reduction in net greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture, but this bill has not been passed. Um, so, so there are efforts. Um, they need political support to get this done. This is a role that we can all play. Uh, and to sum up, we want to restore our beautiful planet. One Health recognizes that life is interconnected and the matrix analysis that we've done shows that there, there are microbial connections between food safety and security, antimicrobial resistance and climate change. We all need to work together to promote One Health education, research, policy development and outreach for for the public and for the policymakers to understand these connections and why we need to address them if we wanna continue uh, agriculture and uh, food security and civilization on the one hand and the continuation of antimicrobials and modern medicine on the other. Uh, if you're more interested in One Health, I have a Coursera course uh, available, focusing on primarily zoonotic diseases, also food safety and security. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in the One Health Initiative, and I'd like to thank all of you for your time and attention, and am happy to take any questions. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. For our online audiences, if you do have any questions, so please type your question in the chat box. And if, while you're uh, thinking about the questions, we do have already pre-collected the question from our students. Uh, I mean, they're over excited by this topic and um, there, we have a couple of questions uh, to ask. The first one is regarding the uh, manual management. So the students, a couple of students are wondering like, are there any other ways that, you know, that we can um, reuse the animal waste other than just the, the manure. You mentioned the, the anti, uh, you know, um, uh, you mentioned the, the uh, greenhouse gas emission issue, the, the uh, microbial uh, infectious disease issue. So what are the other ways that we can do about it? Well, that's a great question. We need to figure out what are we going to be doing with this trillion of kilograms of animal of waste that's being produced each year. Again, sanitation systems are designed to process human waste. Uh, there's no system that I'm aware of that is designed to process animal waste. And if animal waste isn't being used as fertilizer, then it's not clear what it's being used for. And I think this is a, uh, a, um, an opportunity, public-private uh, partnership to try to figure out what to do with all of this animal waste. Um, you know, I, uh, you know I, I've just, all I've seen really is the methane digester collecting the methane from it, but um, it's not really been used much for anything other than fertilizer. And if it's not being used for fertilizer, then it's not really being used for anything other than contaminating the soil, the water, and the atmosphere. So it's a major unaddressed problem that we as a civilization must figure out if we want to uh, you know, 
uh, have a more sustainable future. Thanks, Laura. Uh, we do have another question uh, regarding the policy. Uh, we can see obstacles or implications for this one house uh, framework. I think mean, uh, we see that uh, a comment from Dean Stengelmont also kind of related to this issue. So I'll, I'll read this question first. Um, so we have powerful economic interest in fossil fuels, food industries, truck, uh, and what political and economic strategies have been successful to pivot the vested interest to consider the alliances. So, um, for example, progress in such elements as the use of manure as fertilizer, use of low water agriculture practices, animal feeding, feeding including 10% safety to reduce medicine. Dairy industry and non-dairy products, electric, electric car promotion, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm very interested that uh, California and New York State were able to pass some legislation. I'm not aware of other states doing this, so I'm very interested to find out what were the political conditions that allowed these states to do this? And I'm not aware of countries doing, doing this, you know, focusing on these, ish, these areas. So I think it's a, a ripe for study uh, to figure out, you know, how we can tip the politics to get, you know, uh, legislation in place or to get companies in place uh, that are, you know, that their uh, mission is to, um, to address uh, manure's impact on the environment or on ecosystems. Um, there is um, some research being done at UC Davis on using seaweed to uh, reduce uh, enteric fermentation. Now, seaweed has a compound in it called bromoform. And apparently, bromoform, if it's released into the atmosphere, it has deleterious effects on um, ozone. So, we don't want to solve one problem by worsening another. So, we have to be very careful in whatever we do to make sure that uh, our, our our solutions uh, don't cause unintended consequences. But, you know, I think this is all still in its infancy. Thanks, so, yeah, I think a, a related question from the students is that uh, this is a fascinating idea, the framework of one house. Uh, and you, you, you have mentioned a lot of uh, the things in actually considering the policy engagement. So overall, the students are, are interested to know that what do you think are the largest obstacle you see to kind of engage or impl implement the one house framework into the current policies? I think, uh, well, this concept has been largely driven by veterinarians. It's been very hard to get the medical, the human community engaged. Uh, they don't necessarily see the connections or the bigger picture. Um, in terms of the medical profession, it's under siege, at least in this country. There has been more interest in One Health in Europe, in, uh, on the continent of Africa, Asia, less so in the United States. Again, not sure why. I, I think, you know, our divided politics is certainly not helping. Uh, so, you know, my goal is to try and get the word out, uh, my colleagues as well, uh, you know, through our advocacy work through promoting the concept. And, you know, I'm very grateful to, to you to give me an opportunity to speak to your students today. Thanks, Laura. We're, we're thrilled to have you here. And I'm um, sure it's a very exciting topic that we have a very large online audience. That's the, one of the evidence proof. So um, the, another thing uh, that the students are, are quite interested in is uh, that, you know, um, can you, have a fascinating career uh, as a researcher, as an educator. So our audience today, the, uh, the students are MPH, MPH students. So they are wondering, can you talk a little bit more about your personal uh, experience, about your role in the field as a woman in the STEM field? So it's kind of very general, just for the students, yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, you know, I, I wish I could say that I had a laser focus <laughs> on, on this, but, um, you know, I, I started out in nursing. Uh, my interest was always in public health. Uh, and uh, I worked as a nurse for a couple of years before deciding to go pre-med and then went back to do a post-baccalaureate. This was long before they had post-baccalaureate programs. But I did that and got into medical school. My interest was always in, uh, again, public health, the big picture. Um, I did a, uh, a uh, internal medicine residency and then got a master's in public health and a general medicine fellowship at Columbia. Um, and was working in government doing, um, uh, first I was doing drug safety oversight at the FDA and then moved to the New Jersey Department of Health where I was doing hospital quality oversight when I decided to get a master's in public policy and there were a variety of reasons for that. Uh, and just as I was about to start my master's in public policy, this was in the fall of 2001. And uh, if you remember what happened in the fall of 2001, it was uh, it turned our world upside down. The uh, terrorist attacks of 9-11 followed a month later by the anthrax crisis. And that changed the trajectory of my career. I went into biodefense. And uh, I took a course, uh, Prevention Against Weapons of Mass Destruction, where the focus was on nuclear issues, nuclear disarmament, but I was interested in the biological aspects of it. I joined that research group. And uh, in the course of my policy research, uh, reading the veterinary medical literature, it was stunning to me that there was this overlap between the agents of bioterrorism on the one hand and emerging infectious diseases on the other in that the vast majority of both were zoonotic, meaning that there are diseases of animals that infect people. And yet uh, I, I discovered that physicians and veterinarians rarely if ever talk to each other. And in fact, you know, in my entire medical training, I never once heard the term zoonosis. That's a veterinary term, it's not a medical term. Uh, so there was this huge issue that was just not getting addressed. And, uh, and that's what prompted me to do my research and to write up that article in the Emerging Infectious Disease Journal in 2006. And I got a huge response from the veterinarians and I heard, not, I heard crickets from the physicians. Uh, and, you know, and that lack of interest uh, you know, has continued. Not clear if COVID-19 will change things, but, um, but I'm not so sure. Thanks, Laura. I think this is a fascinating story. And I'm sure people students will be inspired by your story. And since you mentioned the COVID-19, so, uh, one of the uh, questions students have is actually, uh, how has the One House community responded to the COVID-19, especially you know, in, regarding the, the start of this pandemic? has a, a lot to do with animals in China, so treating everything. So what do you comment on that? Yeah, uh, well, uh, those of us in biodefense, I mean, this was a, a catastrophe waiting to happen for a variety of reasons. I mean, one of the, I mean, it was very clear, and I'm, I, right now I'm researching and writing a book about One Health and the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm using this framework to examine this pandemic from all angles. And uh, there are several things that have come out uh, in my investigation. Um, if you compare this pandemic with SARS in a case that emerged in 2002, 2003 in the Guangdong province of China and with MERS, Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome that emerged from Saudi Arabia uh, in 2012. In both those, um, both those uh, spillover events, there was very clear evidence of a natural spillover event. In the case of SARS, there was an almost an exact match of the um, of the virus in animals with the human strain. And also importantly, 
there was occupational evidence that the people who were working with the animals had a higher rate of um, antibodies, higher seroprevalence rate of antibodies to the virus compared to the general population. You saw that with SARS. Similarly with MERS, there was a, a clear, you know, the, the virus was um, uh, identified, isolated from cam dromedary camels. And they looked back, there was serologic evidence from the camels going back decades showing that the virus had been circulating in these animals long before there was a spillover event into a human. Uh, and again, they did a uh, serologic survey of uh, large, like 10,000 people in Saudi Arabia. And again, there was occupational evidence, uh, exposure of those who were working in the slaughterhouse or those who were working with the camels had a much higher seroprevalence rate of antibodies to MERS than to the general population. Now, none of those things are evident with COVID-19. There has been zero animal, uh, there's been no animal host, intermediate host of this virus, unlike SARS and MERS, and there's no serologic evidence of occupational exposure in the uh, animal work and the workers in the Wuhan market um, that, uh, that paints a similar picture to what we saw with SARS and MERS. So um, that leads us to a conundrum as to how this started because we need to figure out how this started so we can prevent uh, another one from happening. And I know this is a very political issue uh, in terms of the origin of the virus, but right now there is no evidence that it was a natural spillover event. Thanks, Laura. Um, I do want to give the opportunity to our current audience. If you do have any other questions, to, so feel free to speak up. And also for online audience, if you have any other questions, please type in the chat box. Yeah, um, for the, the world. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks for that great talk. Um, I just wanted to raise a point that reinforces the complexity of these issues, mm -hmm. which is the capture of methane from manure mm -hmm. um, and using it as so-called renewable natural gas, which is what some of the people are calling it. And so a lot of environmental justice people are actually against the use of that uh, in CAFOs because they feel that it in, essentially entrenches the CAFOs when, you know, CAFOs, as you've pointed out, have a lot of problems for the surrounding communities, et cetera, where a lot of people feel they need to be fundamentally reformed as a, and that the renewable natural gas is a form of greenwashing. Um, so I don't know if you've heard that argument, but I just wanted to put that out there and see how yeah. you respond. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Well, um, yes, I know a lot of people in the environmental community are against doing anything with the CAFOs because they feel they should all be going out of business. Um, I think given that eating meat is the norm in most countries, uh, I think expecting people to become vegetarian or vegan is unrealistic. Um, I did not include my slide on the pros and cons to eating meat. There are pros, of course, and there are cons. Uh, and some have argued that we evolved into modern humans because we hunted, cooked, and ate meat. Um, you know, again, that's debatable, but uh, nevertheless, um, the, it is a deeply ingrained in our cultures and our religions. And I think uh, we need to be realistic in what we're dealing with. So we need to try and make civilization as sustainable as possible um, and figure out ways to curtail the negative externalities of these industries, um, recognizing that you know, it would be ideal if everyone became vegetarian. But again, I think that's, I mean, 
we're, we're divided politically as it is, demanding <laughs> that people change their deeply ingrained eating behavior, not easy to do. I mean, it's, it's hard to do, uh, you know, as a practicing physician to, you know, tell somebody to cut back on meat, telling an entire culture or entire society, uh, it's just not, uh, not realistic in my book. Thanks, Laura. I think oh, are kind of related to question to your last point is the students also recognize that it's unrealistic to just shut down the meat consumption. Uh, so the students, uh, they, they kind of an interesting question for you is that, do you think like to what extent do the more so-called the affluent countries that have a lot of power resources need to subst subst uh, subsidize better sanitation systems in places for mm -hmm. in, in the low middle income countries? that they are lacking uh, the, the resources. So do well, you think these, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we, we uh, have a responsibility. I mean, since we've been such major energy users and meat consumers in this country, uh, I think we have an obligation to other countries to try to uh, ensure their survival. Um, there's, there's much more that we can be doing. And I think those are important topics for uh, worthy of study and, um, you know, and other courses. So uh, again, there's, there's much that can be done that, that we must do. Thanks, Laura. Uh, any other follow-on questions? So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ken, uh, for a wonderful talk and thanks for everyone for joining us online and also in person. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you so much. Just a reminder, our recording will be online on Central website. So thanks again, Dr. King.